past this old house, our experts travel across the country to answer questions about your house. Today, we'll explain everything you need to know about smart doorbells, show you how to paint wood paneling, break down the tools electricians use most, and we'll install overhead recess lights to brighten up a dark room. Looks so good. Really appreciate your help. On Ask This Old House. is going on here? Doorbell? Gotta be Ross. Look who showed up. I had a feeling it was you when I saw the new me. gadget on the building and all. What were you doing? Look at that. I could see you came. I could see that you're late. <laughs> Just a little bit late. Good heavens. But yeah, it's a smart doorbell. Yeah. So obviously explains what we're talking about today. That's right. So I got a bunch of these on the, you know, there are a bunch on the market today. Because they're super popular. They're so popular everywhere, right? Right. And uh, they have a lot of bells and whistles, a lot of features. So I would say in the last three to five years, these things went from hardly anyone had them to now it seems like everybody's got them. That's true. And as you say, lots of different manufacturers. All right. Yep. Uh, you know, basic care and feeding, the operation, how do they work? Yeah, so every one of these has the same basic features. They all do motion detection. So if you walk up to this device or any of these devices, the notification will be sent to the phone. Right. And the phone is basically going to let you know, hey, that person's there and you can see them. So that happens before I push the button to ring the doorbell. That's right, yeah. Anytime it sees motion, it's going to alert you to your phone. And what happens when I push Press the video doorbell? Now you get two-way audio. Oh. So now I can actually have a conversation with you with my phone, whether I'm home or whether I'm away. It doesn't matter. I can still see for peace of mind who's at the front door. So in terms of installation, um, if I've got an existing doorbell, is it an easy swap in and out? Exactly right. So for a regular wired video doorbell, it's like this, and there's a base plate. And so you can see you take your existing two wires, the red and white, they land on those two terminals, just like you would have with any other doorbell. So low voltage, and you're good to go. Yep, there's your power there. And if you don't have the wires, for example, then you go to a battery-operated one. So with this, you can see it's much larger. So these are essentially the same model, but that bigger size is accounting for the fact that that's all battery driven. That's right, the rechargeable battery on the back is what needs to be recharged every one to six months, depending on how much usage you have and also how cold it is outside. Oh, that's not too bad. So I can go a month or more with that whole thing before I gotta swap it out. Yep, and pop the battery out and recharge it and then you're off and running. Cool, all right. Um, and so when I push this button, what's actually going on, right? Because now I'm I'm talking to you, so I'm sending data, not over this little wire, right? That's right. So this is just for power. Everything is Wi-Fi connected. Wi -Fi. Right? So all of these are connected to your home through Wi-Fi. And so it's very important that when you before you install these, you make sure you have a good Wi-Fi signal outside your house where you're going to locate these devices. And how do I do that? And so you're going to take your phone out, go to one of those speed test apps, right, and check to see what your signal is outside the house in that location. Standing right there. Standing right there. What's so a bad connection? So like two megabytes, three megabytes a second is not going to cut it. You're going to need something much higher than that to get that video and that crisp response. Right. Otherwise, you're not. It's going to be choppy. You're not going to have a good signal. It could disconnect. So. So that, and it's, it's a, literally, it's a live video, so you do need that sort of bandwidth. You do, you do, yeah. And if I don't have good Wi-Fi? So you have to either add a Wi-Fi extender or move your mesh, you know, routers closer to the outdoor. You know, going through brick and going through stucco, that's a really th hard thing for Wi-Fi signals to do. Okay. So uh, it's important. Uh, and all these devices store the images locally on the device, and unless you pay for a subscription. Hmm. If you pay for a subscription through a monthly service, then it goes to the cloud. So if I don't go to the cloud, I can get a couple of days with the video, mm -hmm. something happens away for the weekend, I go grab it. Longer than that, it's erased automatically. That's right, it's erased. So I go to the cloud for the, I want to be in the That's cloud. Right. Everyone wants to be in the cloud. The cloud's great. Yeah. But, <laughs> you know, when you put things to the cloud, you bring up privacy and other concerns. Yeah, so let's right. talk about privacy and security. First of all, right. they don't activate the door lock, right? They don't open the door. No, so if this were to be hacked, for example, it's only going to get into this device. It's not going to get into the rest of your house. Unless, of course, that you have this connecting to a smart door lock where they have a back end to get into the into the door lock. And being in the cloud um, uh, opens it up to being hacked from people far away. Yep. What should we do to protect against that? Yes, yeah, so what you really want to look for is 256-bit encryption. You want to look for two-factor authentication, uh -huh. and you really want to read the fine print for how these companies deal with your data. Meaning okay? don't share my data. You don't want to share it with a third party. 
or any affiliate or anything like that. So you want to make sure you read the fine print. I know it's people don't want to read those manuals, but it's important, right? Okay. To make sure that they do. All right. So that's one problem with a downside. Although it sounds like you got solutions for that. Any other downsides with these things? The other one is false alerts, right? So they all will detect motion, but the thing is, how sensitive do you want that motion to be? If it, you know, if a moth flies by, you don't want it to alert you, right? But you want to make sure it alerts you when a person is there. So that sensitivity is uh, something that can be adjusted, but they still are not that great. Gotcha. And in terms of price these days, I mean, they've been around long enough, so I presume prices come down. Yeah, so from $100 for the standard versions all up to $200 for the really the premium end versions for these. Beautiful. All yeah, right, Ross. So low cost options. As always, great information. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. I'll take this one. Hey, Marl. Hello, Kevin. So, as you know, we get a lot of questions about painting wood paneling. Yes. Um, and people, it, it gets a lot of them nervous. <laughs> they don't want to paint the original panel all the time. And you also wonder if they can do it or not. And so your thoughts on it? Oh, absolutely you can, but it all depends who you ask to. Remember one thing, removing paint is much harder than put paint on it. True. What about philosophically? When you see old wood paneling, natural wood, how do you feel about painting over it? I mean, you get asked to do it a lot, so you do it a lot, but you know, okay, good to do, sacrilegious, what? I mean, believe it or not, we're doing a lot of this lately. Yeah. People want to see more color than natural wood on our days. Okay. So sometimes if we see like a beautiful wood, the mahogany, I, I kind of say, well, I mean, I'm a, I love the way mahogany looks, but if they wanted to paint, this is what I do. All right. So this is raw wood, um, but is the technique the same? We're going to start with a light sanding? We're going to start with the light sanding. We're going to sand it out just light. Just needs to be crazy. Looks like you got, I'm, I'm feeling like a 220 here on my Like path. we got a, like a 220 grit paper, just lightly sand. And if this were covered in a varnish or a poly, again, not trying to take it off, just trying to break the surface. Yeah, we don't need to strip it down at the bare wood. All we need to is rough up the surface a little bit, just in order to get a, uh, the primer to get a good grip on it. All right, Kevin, we're ready to prime. Did you tint that? Awesome. Yeah, this is a tinted primer. It's just like gray because we're gonna use it in a darker color for final coat, so this will help with the coverage. All right, I'm going to start at this end here. I'm going to start to take care of all the grooves on this bead board. So if you want to do some on that side panel there. So here's the primer. Let's start to get it done. You got it. You know what they say, right? No, what do they say? A great paint job and a good wine takes time. <laughs> I notice you've got a roller here ready to go. Would you be rolling this normally or? Yes. Be rolling. We're gonna cut all the, the edges and the corners, and then we'll be rolling the fields. Kevin, it's been about an hour. The prime is dry. If you notice, I filled up all the nail holes. Mm -hmm. Did a little touch up on the nail holes patching, and lightly sand. Everything is nice and clean. Okay. And it's time for us to put some paint on it. And we got a green color here that you chose. Got this dark green. It looks lighter there, but once it dries, it dries darker there. Same technique? Same technique. We cut around the corners and the edges, and we're going to roll the field. Yeah, it's going to look fantastic. This is kind of a thing, right? Every piece of this wall, you know, from the stool to the nosing to the panels, even to the baseboard, all the same color. All the same color. It's a big trend right now, which it looks great. You know? OK, looking pretty good, Marl. Very good. It's a little blotchy right now because it's still wet and it's, it's setting up. It's still drying. It's drying process. Once it dries, you'll see less of that. So one of one coat or one of two coats? Top this coat. This is first of two coats. We first coat's done. We're going to wait about two hours. We'll come back. We'll put the final coat. And it's going to look nice. All right. Good information. Good technique. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey. Hey, Kevin. How you doing? Good. So off to a house call. What do you got? Recess cans today? Recess lights today, yeah. Very good. All yeah. packed up, ready to go. You got enough screwdrivers there? <laughs> <laughs> One or two. So, I mean, you must have three or four go-to tools in here, despite all the screw type, screwdrivers that you love. We have a little bit of everything to kind of cover you, but yeah, there's always the staples that we keep all the time. Walk me through them. What, what do you need? Number one, 
My linesman's pliers. Linesman pliers. You guys never have these out of your hands. What do you love about them? What do they do for you? Well, one, they pretty much do everything for us. Like you said before, they're they're a hammer. They do everything. But they look a little unusual. Some people may not want to use them. Like in, you think of an automotive set of pliers, it's a little different because these are flat and hard to grip. Right. They're perfect for twisting wires and making a nice straight cut on something. Beefy. Um, back pocket. Gets everything done. All right. Yes. Linesman pliers on the list. What else? All right. Instead of using all the screwdrivers, if we just have to take one with us, <laughs> I'll take this one. Because? It's a multi-screwdriver, and a lot of times, I was a hard sell, I wasn't always a fan because you'd lose the bits, yeah. but this one really works out well. So that's two bits, there's got to be some more hidden here it somewhere. It does, then you can actually pull this part out and change the other side. Okay, there you go. And it has the most common tips we use, like a number two square drive for a lot of the terminals or in breakers, yep. um, the Phillips bit, but it's also nut drivers for different oh, sizes. Nice. Also. So it works out really, really well, it's good and solid. You don't lose the bits easily, not too flimsy. Yeah, you got one or two things in your pouch, you want something like that. What else, what else, what else? All right, the next one, always have diagonal cutters. Diagonal cutters, so clearly for cutting wire, but mm -hmm. I mean, why would you carry these in addition to those, and what's with the shape? So the point of it can actually get into a tighter space if you're cutting an individual conductor or have a harder area to get into versus something like this. Yep, and nice and flush in the back right there. It is, and you notice the curve on this? I like the curve style for a reason. These are perfect if you're putting an M cable in and you staple something where you don't want it or you right. have to remove it. You can actually grab the staple with that tip on the edge and rock that right out because of that shape. A little bit of leverage right yeah. there. Got it. Okay. Anything else Next. you recommend? The wire strippers. You know, I mean, I've told you this before, but I used to think this was cheating because I've seen you guys strip any wire with these perfectly. You can. Right. But I was like, oh, I got to use this. But I mean, they really work. I've got myself a couple pairs now. They so do. they've got the different gauges. Yep. Um, and you can even take the sheeting off of the wire, the cable as well, right? You can. It's just much faster. No damage to any of the conductors. Holy smokes. Look and at just that. like that, it's ready to go. That was like milliseconds. That's awesome. Yeah, I don't think it's cheating anymore. <laughs> I got a pair. And you must have a, some sort of an electrical tester in here somewhere to... There we go. Always, right on the side, ready to get to. So this one's a non-contact tester. Meaning what? So you just put that tip of that to the wire to tell whether it's energized or not energized. Put it close, just touch it right there, yeah. let you know it's live. It'll change color, it'll turn red, it'll start chirping, yeah. it'll let you know that it's live. Another thing I have several of <laughs> in every bag because I'm terrified of getting electrocuted. So even in my carpentry bag, I've got one of those as well. All right, what else? I'd say the final go-to would probably be a the good torpedo, torpedo level. level. Yeah. With the magnets? With the magnets. Gonna, let's see. Yeah, that's magnetic, that's right? Magnetic. All right, so makes sense. You guys are putting boxes in or you got plates sure, on the lineup. Sure, you want to keep the plate straight, putting a cab in, you want to do that. But it has a couple of different vials in here that you may not always be used to seeing. You'll Which, see or what? You know, a straight and a 90 of a 45, but we also have a 30. Which and you guys use for what? Perfect when we're bending metal conduit for making some of the bends. We can Put that right on the conduit, pull it up, stop it at the 30 degree mark, and yep. continue on. Beautiful. All right. And then, of course, there's this thing, which I see you use. And I mean, this, when I watch you use this, this thing is awesome. The, the and dust you're shroud. Need this, right? I am going to need that. The yep. dust shroud for the uh, cans you're going to put in right now. Yep. So, hole saw in your drill, right? And you start putting uh, holes in the ceiling right there. Everything's coming down on you. Yeah, Plastic even if you guns. try to run a vacuum, you're right. still not going to catch it all. Put this in between those two, and then that goes up. Catches everything. And no, you don't need a vac? No. You don't have to complicate it? You might get a little dust if it's a textured ceiling sneaking out, but it's really great. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, like I said, you're going to need that. I need that. And since you I got duped this. of everything Kevin. else, good luck. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Hi, Heath. Thanks so much for coming to our house. Hey, Katie. Thanks for having me. Yeah, nice to meet you. So we just moved in here a few months ago. I've got my husband and my two small kids. The house is great. We're loving it. We've got this room off to the side, though, that we kind of use as a playroom. Sure. Which is what I called you for, so. So now that you've had a chance to be here for a couple of months, you can kind of get a feel for the things you like, maybe some of the things you want to change, and this might be one of them. Yeah, absolutely. Let's take a look check at it. Check it out? All right. Oh, this is Zoe. Hi, Zoe. Good pop. <laughs> so these are some of the recessed lights that you like. Exactly. So, you know, living room, we're in this room all the time. The, the brightness level is great. Um, we would love more of these. Sure. We come into the playroom <laughs> and it's just... It's a little dark. bit darker. Yeah, there's no lights. Um, we've got this kind of dingy lamp over here. We do have a switch. Okay. But it doesn't really do anything, though. 
Right, so chances are that it goes to a receptacle somewhere in this room, but it's obviously not the one the lamp's plugged into, so you have to kind of turn that on manually still. And it's not worth moving around. We don't like the light from that lamp anyway. We're looking at doing the recessed in here. So I think that's definitely possible, but there are a couple of things we want to take a look at. First being is, what do we have above us? Do we have a closet, a bedroom? It's a bathroom. It's a bathroom, of course. <laughs> so we're going to have to take some measurements and kind of get an idea of where some of the drain pipes may land, some of the other water pipes. It's going to limit us as far as room and getting a recessed light in there, but we do have some options with some thinner versions that we can still make work. Uh, next thing is I want to take a look in the basement. I think it's unfinished under this portion. You can take a look and see some of the framing, get an idea of how things are built, what the spacing is, and what we might run into in the ceiling and the wall. With that being said, I think we can get a couple of recessed lights in here fairly easily if you want to go ahead and get started. Awesome. Yeah, sounds great. All right, let's turn the power off and get to it. All right, Katie, uh, before we go making any holes, we want to do as much exploration into seeing where things are as we can. So we know we have that bathroom upstairs. It's always a concern. But when we did our measurements, we found that the plumbing is really only rolling along the wall over here. It shouldn't be too much in the way for us coming out of the wall switch up to our first light. I think we'll be okay with that. The other thing we took a look at were the floor joists in the basement, kind of get an idea of where things may be running. And from looking at that and taking down one of the recessed lights in the living room, we found the floor joists go this way. This is perfect. This will let us come out of that switch, come up the wall, and right down this first bay to our recessed lights. That should make it easy for us. The other thing we found when we took down that recessed light is we have strapping as well. We thought we would in this house, but it's good to verify. Once we have that, that'll let us go this way to the recessed lights without doing any more damage. We should be able to snake right underneath the floor joist in between the strapping to go from light to light and we should be good. Now, we did find what that switch controlled. It is a receptacle in this room. We actually have constant power on the bottom half of this receptacle, and the top half was controlled by that switch. We're gonna rewire that so that the whole receptacle has constant power, and we're also gonna let us send power over here, so we're gonna have constant power at the switch. Then we can come out of the switch, up the wall to the recessed lights, so that'll still control the lights, constant power there, and we should be good. I'm glad you're here with me, Heath. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, let's, let's get started. All right, so we turned the breaker off, but we want to make sure it's really off before we go ahead and take anything apart. So I'm just gonna plug the tester in to be sure. All right, that is off. So I'll take the screwdriver for starters, and we'll take that plate off. Great, and now the screw gun, please. Perfect. All right, Katie, so this is how that switched receptacle works. So we have constant power here where all these wires are tied together under this wire nut and a single wire coming to this brass screw. That's actually powering this bottom receptacle constantly. Now, normally there'd be a brass tab right here that would connect the two so they'd both be live all the time. This has been broken off so that only the bottom half is live. Now, what they did is they took a 14-2 and tied the white wire to the constant power as well. This is what actually is sending power back out to our switch on that white wire. And when you turn the switch on, it comes back on this black wire right here to this screw. That would liven up this top receptacle. So if you plug the lamp into this top guy, when you turn that switch on and off, that's what would turn on and off. Okay. We're going to go ahead and get rid of this, replace this, uh, and make this all constant power as one. I'll give you that. I'll take the new one. Perfect. And could I have the yellow handle needle nose, please? And if we look at that one, we actually have that brass tab in place that keeps both of these tied together. Okay. And this white wire that was sending power back up is now going to become a neutral like it is everywhere else. And if you want to pass me one of those tan wire nuts. Great. And next we're going to do the same thing for the black wires. Fold that in the back as well. And then we'll do the same for the black wire. And then we can go ahead and tuck this back in and screw it into place. And lastly, the plate. Next, we're going to go ahead and take this switch out. All right, and there we 
we can see the white wire that was coming up providing power. And then when you turn this on, it would close and send power back down the black. And we're just gonna take this off. And then we're gonna take a multi-tool, go up at an angle, cut the nail up here, cut it up here, and we should be able to slide this right out. Something like that. All right, so now we'll take the mirror. This is the easiest way to look up inside here. We can tip this back and forth and look up that bay. Nothing coming through the top plate, so it looks like we should be clear for drilling. Awesome. I'm going to use a dust shroud to keep the dust from falling everywhere in the room. There it is. I'm also gonna drill a hole through the top plate of the wall to give us a place to run the wire from the switch up to the ceiling. Katie, I'm going to push the wire up the wall and try and get it across the hole I just oh. drilled. Can you reach and try and catch it? Got it. <laughs> All right, we'll take that out a little bit. There we go. All right, so now that we have this through, we're gonna take our wire, just gonna make a little loop through that end. Squeeze that shut so it's flat. And then we're gonna tape it as smooth as possible so we can pull it back down through that hole to our switch box. And perfect, just like that. Look at that. And now we'll just uh, fish the wires over to the couple of other holes and we'll start putting the recessed lights in. Now we can start wiring the fixtures. These lights actually have two components, the junction box where the wiring goes and an LED fixture that plugs into that junction box. I'll start by wiring the junction box with the wire that has a hot, neutral, and ground conductor. The junction box goes up into the hole in the ceiling. It secures in place by installing a screw and then hanging the junction box on the keyhole slot in the back. And now for the light. These LED recessed lights work great for retrofit applications because of how thin they are. All you do is plug the fixture into the junction box, install the junction box in the hole you cut, and then the clamps on the fixture itself hold it in place in the ceiling. And finally, we're going to install a dimmer in place of the switch that controlled the receptacles before. Power's back on, the lights are all made up. You want to awesome. do the honors and give them a try? Yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> that looks really good. No, it's nice and bright in here. Now you can actually see everything. We put a dimmer on it if you do want to drop it down a little bit and you should be good. Awesome, looks so good. Really appreciate your help. Glad to help. Next time on Ask This Old House, we'll explain how bricks are made. Show you different ways to fit and connect pipes. I don't know if you saw, but there's some duct tape on the, on the top of the... <laughs> and we'll teach you everything you need to know about reshingling a shed roof. All that next time on Ask This Old House.